Hey folks, Justin Angle here from the New Angle Podcast. We're here today with Henderson K. Shatner, the songwriter, singer, and multi-instrumentalist behind Catnip. HKS, thanks for being here today. Always a pleasure. So, okay, tell us about Catnip, how the project came to be. Oh, first of all, what is it? Is it a band? Is it a solo project? Is it? How would you describe this, this entity? It's kind of all of the above. I have a group of people that I tend to work with either in the studio or live. And, um, you know, the pandemic actually blew that apart. So the live show is, you know, not where it needs to be, you know, but that's where we are in life. You know, I don't want this to be a, a pandemic album. I think we were up to our neck in those, but um, it just, that's how it all kind of unfolded. You know, the fact that I had all this time, I had planned on working on an album anyway, nobody was around or the people who were around were worried about, you know, masking up and all that. So I learned how to play drums and just recorded a bunch of tracks. Yeah. So this is the fourth album appropriately named Catnip 4. Love the creativity there. Yeah. It's actually Catnip I, 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 I. You have to say it that way. No, you don't. Okay. (laughs) So Catnip 4, and you sort of alluded to this you kind of do everything yourself in many ways on this album. We have we have people help at different stages. We'll get to that. But talk about that process. Having you learn how to do drums, how did you put it all together? I had some guitar parts written, you know, just little snippets here and there. And then I thought, well, the best thing I should do is put those together in a you know reasonably song-shaped order. And then I basically spent about two months just playing drums along to my favorite records. And sure. that's how I trained myself to play drums. I didn't want to be too ambitious and quote unquote become a great drummer. That was not the ambition, but I did want to be able to play well enough to hold a song together. And I think you'll hear that. Like there, absolutely, there are some points there where I could have, if I had been a good drummer, like done a really interesting something, <laughs> and didn't. But what's really funny about that is it actually makes the album sound, in a funny way, really disciplined. Like there's one track where there's like no fill in between two of the parts. And the drummer friend of mine said, man, nerves of steel. And it was like, no, I mean, I didn't right. want to mess up. Right, you know? right. You held off the temptation to go yeah. bigger. Yeah, because if I had gone bigger, I would have gone off time or screwed something up. Sure, so. I understand that. So talk about this moment you're at. We're catching you, or the, my understanding is the album is locked, releases in April of 2022. How does it feel right now to have this thing completed that you poured your soul into, but it has yet to sort of be out in the wild emotionally it's really hard because there's always a come down like you know as far as i'm concerned this is the best thing i've ever done i really like it i think you know i'm singing really high really low great melodies hitting the notes i need to hit interesting lyrics really carefully crafted phrasing in the vocals so i'm really proud of it vocally in a lot of ways as well but then all of a sudden i mean literally it's it i have to park it and I'm actually going to go record another EP just to kind of do something with my time. Right, right. Keep the juices flowing. Yeah, exactly. And so let's talk about the music itself. Why don't you just describe some of your musical influences and inter- interests? Where does this sort of lie in the positioning matrix? Obviously, you'll hear I'm a you know Beatles fan and right. you know classic rock kind of fan. You'll hear that come through. But also, you know, I grew up in the '80s and '90s, and um, so I'm a huge Pixies fan and Nirvana fan. Mm-hmm. I love Weezer. Um, a little later, I like, you know, Hives and Strokes and that direction, you know, even a little bit Brian Jonestown Massacre. But what I love about the Pixies and Nirvana was their kind of kind of jagged guitar sounds, really weird chord progressions, weird song arrangements, where sometimes the Pixies in particular would just cut a beat off or cut a measure off and, and do things differently. So I drew a lot of inspiration from that. Which is kind of the opposite of what they say you ought to be doing these days, because there's so it's very prescriptive, like how you know how to craft a pop song for sure. consumption now. But I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be constrained by that. You know, I was really in, influenced by um, McCartney three. Mm-hmm. So Paul McCartney r- recorded an album during what he called Rock Down, and it was quite inspirational because it's actually probably the best record he's done in like twenty years or longer. I think it's incredible, and. The interesting thing there was, you know, he's not following any of those rules. Now, then again, he doesn't have to, does he? He's Paul McCartney. But 
you know, I listened to a lot of the arrangements, and it's like he he didn't care. He he recorded what he wanted to record. He he crafted some great pop songs out of, out of it. And you know, I'm I'm hoping people are kind of sophisticated and curious enough that the fact that I've done you know verse verse half a verse chorus no refrain chorus again. I think it sounds good. That's how the song came out. I'm not going to change it just because somebody says, oh, you need to do this and that if sure. this is going to be a pop song. And so so you got into some of the structure there, but one of the things that stood out to me listening to the music is there's a simplicity to it and, and largely probably born out of necessity, like the number of instruments and mm-hmm. the complexity of the mix, but but it's it's got this edge to it that... You know, talk about how that came to be, because you know a lot of music right now doesn't quite have the same edge. But this music, I mean, you're you're listening to something different when you turn and tune into this. Yeah, I'm glad you 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 say that, and I'm glad your ears picked that up, because um, a lot of it comes down to I don't listen to a lot of popular music, which I should never admit in public. But I went out and listened to a bunch of stuff, and it felt really kind of I, I hate to use the word tame, but like not very edgy. And one of the things I love about, we just talked about Nirvana and the Pixies, was talk about edgy and exciting. Right, right. You know, dark and light, loud and quiet, you know, unexpected things happening, you know, really pure instruments. And so the way I recorded was really mic in front of the amp, not a lot else going in. And when we mixed it, what I, I told Brian who mixed it, I want it to sound like a demo in terms of energy but I want it to sound like a platinum record in terms of audio quality. And that's a really hard mix, but I do think he nailed it. It's like drums, bass, guitar, vocal on most of these songs. Not a lot of overdubs. You know, a couple of them have overdubs. And as you say, there's a simplicity, but man, there's a density there because everything's yeah. right there. Everything's really present. So we should take a moment to just mention Brian Reeves, the mixer who who, who you worked with on this album. I mean, he's worked with the likes of U2, Miley Cyrus, and yeah, talk a little bit more about his influence. You mentioned it there just a moment, but like, how did that collaboration kind of come to be? He's just a really nice guy, very easy to communicate with, very thick skin, um, because he has to realize your vision. Um, And he's got a lot of experience. And he works within parameters that he will never put anything out that isn't going to sound to his ear really good. Yeah, And knowing that, I could push him pretty hard, like, you know, telling him, I want to hear the guitars on the edge of feedback. You know, I want to hear, like, noises. I want to hear noises, and you know, I don't mind if there's a bit of string buzz or whatever. You know, I want you to to make it sound visceral and lean without sacrificing audio quality. And that's a tightrope, particularly for a professional like him. Um, but I think he nailed it. I mean, I, I got the mixes back, and I was, like, jumping up and down screaming. So Right on. So who do you want to listen to this album? Good question. If you like Nirvana, if you like the Pixies, if you like Weezer, you're going to like this. You know, if you like some of the Beatles' edgier stuff, you're going to like this music. You know, I can almost guarantee that. Okay, so the first single off the album is titled Big Sky. It has a surf rock feel while exploring historic yet still salient themes in the American West. Tell us about Big Sky. Okay, so I worked with Emily Dolan Davis, who's a drummer in the UK. Um, she's drummed with Brian Ferry and The Darkness, and um, you know she's a very well-respected studio and live mm-hmm. musician. She and I just wanted to do a collaboration, so she sent some drum tracks over. I was really struggling to make it song-shaped, so I, I kind of did what in studio parlance is slicing and dicing. I just cut the hell out of her track and just moved things around and okay. made, made it how I wanted it to go. Put on a really aggressive bass line. And then one day I walked in the studio and I said, oh, I'm going to work on this track. And I picked up my Fender Jaguar guitar and it just came out. I mean, it came out of the guitar because it's a surf guitar. It, I just did these twangy, surfy lines. There's two like twangy surf lines crossing each other, mm-hmm. just like surfers do. And um, the, so the instrumental was all done. I put in some pixies kind of, you know, just harmonics or, you know, just letting the bang in the guitar and letting it sing. And you know, made it feel that kind of Pixies, surf rock kind of feel. And then it came time to put lyrics on it. Yeah. And the lyrics are striking. Oh, I mean, they're courageous lyrics. Well, yeah, thanks. And I think, I think it's, it's like you said, it's relevant to the time we live in where you have the, you know, public land in the American West, which is an amazing asset for all of us. 
And yet increasingly it's being privatized. It's being bought up by people who have a lot of money and they're cutting off access for the people who, you know, ought to be able to access that land. You know, I, I live in Missoula, Montana, and house prices are out of reach for, for most average people here. Rents are really, really high. It seemed to me it was a story that, you know, needed to be told, or at least I needed to get it out of my system. Um, you know, even using the cliche, Big Sky, as the title of the song, was a really deliberate move um, mm -hmm. to just nod to that sort of dream of the open American West, but only if you got a fat checkbook. And um, so the lead character in the song, the kind of lead narrator, is, you know, either from California or New Jersey, you know, made a lot of money in the tech industry or whatever, and uh, is now, you know, coming to Big Sky and ex excited about the buffalo and the antelope and kind of get the sense he's a little disappointed by it all, that, you know, maybe he hasn't been able to buy, you know, his piece of, of, of Montana. So that's kind of where that song came from. It kind of grew very organically. I think the interesting thing about Big Sky is it's a great kickoff to the album because the album has a lot of travel and kind of adventurous travel experience. It's semi-autobiographical. You know, there's there's definitely elements of relationships I've been in and places I've been all over the world. And I think Big Sky just kicks off this adventure that this album um, brings to you. Well, it's a powerful song. Let's take a listen. Is weird. 